It is about 2.01 and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here and this is being recorded. So uh, anything that you miss in this meeting, you'll be uh, able to find a link that will be posted on the Oklahoma City uh, Arts and Cultural Affairs webpage. We'll give you that information in just a moment. Robbie, would you introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. I'm Robbie Kenzel. I'm the Arts Liaison and Program Planner for the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs. And we thank you, so many of you, for being here. We've got 17 lined up on the call now. So Excellent. thanks. And I'm Randy Marks, a Public Arts Project Manager for the City of Oklahoma City. And we're talking about the murals project at Manuel Perez Park. So if you came looking for something else, well, feel free to stay with us, but uh, that's what we'll be talking about. And uh, you can ask questions about other things. And uh, we will um, talk about those some other time. Now, I'm going to uh, just make sure, I'm gonna check with one of our members here. So, um, Gabe, would you unmute can, if you can hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So could you hear everything that we said so far? Yeah. You, OK. Sounds good. OK. I'm going to mute you again. I just want to be sure, and I'll explain all of this weirdness here in just a second. So we were notified of uh, some heightened security risk with this meeting. And so we changed it from a regular meeting to a webinar which means there's more security in place. You won't be able to talk unless we uh, specifically allow you to talk. It's not gonna be as interactive as regular meetings are. But what you will be able to do is uh, look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see Q&A and you can send questions into us. So, uh, and you can do that at any time, but we're not gonna start answering those until after we've gone through the RFQ and uh, done one or two other things, but go ahead and send questions in whenever you want to. We will cut off the questions probably, or we'll quit answering just a little, the three or very, very soon thereafter, you can continue to communicate with us by email. And what is that email, Robbie? It's okcarts at okc.gov. Thank you very much. So feel free to send in uh, questions. Now, we may not be able to answer those questions directly be for reasons uh, that have to do with the bidding process. Certain questions have to be asked through BidSync, and, um, and I'll explain this all in a little bit. As a matter of fact, any of the information that is shared in this webinar today that is not already included in the RFQ is going to be added into the record in BidSync as questions and answers because it becomes part of the public record. In any governmental bidding process, which is what this is, is very important that all of the participants have all of the same information and that there is no favoritism shown to anybody. So that's the way that we're able to do that. Having said that, I'm going to uh, share a screen and show you something. So uh, what you should be seeing right now, and Robbie, correct me if I'm wrong, is this is the web page for the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs. Yes. And, and this is at okc.gov forward slash arts. And I'm gonna throw that up on the screen in just a moment, but I just wanna show you what is on here. All kinds of great information. Robbie is um, a whiz at social media, unlike me, who is a Luddite and troglodyte when it comes to those things, but she posts all of the important news from our office, including calls to artists. She posts them, posts them here on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, other, other social media platforms yet to be announced. If you go to this site, you can see information about the Arts Commission, so on and so forth. Under Here's the part I want to call out to your attention. You see public art, Opportunities and Announcements. We're going to click on that. Now, under Opportunities and Announcements, I want to, here is this particular RFQ. RFQ means Request for Qualifications. It's another term for Call to Artists. So you, I'm not going to click on this right now, but if you 
if you click on this, you can read the RFQ. We're going to go through it in just a moment, but you can you can access this right here. But also look at this. If you are not registered in BidSync, this is this is where you find the information for how to register in BidSync. Okay, tuck that away into part of your brain because we're going to talk about it in just a little bit. Now I'm going to uh, get out of this. And we'll go to full screen here. Okay, Robbie, is that the first page of the RFQ? It is, yes. So BidSync is a bidding platform that we use. Uh, other cities, other organizations use CAFE or there's a, a bunch of other formats that can be used. We use BidSync because it is the bidding platform that is used all across the city of Oklahoma City and uh, we're required to use it. It is not ideally suited for art, but it works well enough. And you have to be registered in BidSync in order to apply uh, for one of our art projects if the budget for that art project is over $25,000. The budget on this one or the art award is $41,000. So it is listed in BidSync. So if you go into BidSync and you're registered and you click on the page uh, that tells you about this particular bid or this particular project, it will eventually take you to this document, which is the RFQ. Now we're gonna go through a, some of it pretty quickly. Uh, this is information that is uh, contact information. You can, if you need to contact us, you can see, uh, you can see there's my email. Also Robbie's email is, there's Robbie's our admin assistant, so you can contact any of us. Now, it isn't important that you go through and read all of this in depth. Scan it, but uh, you can go fairly quickly through the, about the first 10 pages or so. It's not that it's not important, it's just not really important for you to know all of that in detail if you're submitting your qualifications to be involved in a project with the city. Now we're getting to the important stuff. So, uh, and we put this right up front so you will not forget. The deadline for responses is four, notice it says four zero zero dot dot zero zero. That means exactly at four o'clock bidding closes, closes. If you are in the middle of submitting your response and not finished at four o'clock central standard time on Wednesday, December the 16th, your, your uh, response will not go through and we won't get it and there's nothing we can do about it. This is law, it, we can't change it. So please, 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 if you're really interested in this project, submit on Tuesday if you're going to wait, consider Tuesday to be the last minute. Don't wait till Wednesday at three o'clock and start trying to upload your materials. Uh, like I said, the deadline comes and goes and there's nothing we can do about it. This is some more information that again, uh, scan it, just tells you a little bit more about BidSync and about the city here again. We're getting into more important information for you today. So this is the murals project for Manuel Perez Park. Total art award $41,000. This went live on November the 25th and the bid deadline once again, we're reminding you again, December 16th, 2020. Uh, you can read this for yourself once you get into it, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about Manuel Perez Park. Manuel Perez was a World War II um, well, first of all, he was native of Oklahoma City, who later moved to Chicago. There's a park named for him in Oklahoma City and also a park named for him in Chicago. Uh, he uh, was, um, I forgot the actual term, uh, not, he was a war hero. I'm going to leave it at that. He was, he was a war hero and uh, justly is honored. Now, Manuel Perez Park, the original one, Manuel Perez Park in Oklahoma City, is right where Lower Scissortail Park is being constructed right now, uh, just south of the interstate in Oklahoma City. Um, when it was determined that 
Lower Scissortail Park was going to take over Manuel Perez Park. Manuel Perez Park was moved to a part, portion of Wiley Post Park, which is also right on the river in South Oklahoma City. And it was expanded. So there's a lot more to Manuel Perez Park than there used to be. There, was, there is a memorial that was just completed and dedicated on Veterans Day on November the 11th, which is another part of the park. The Matt Hoffman Action Sports Park is embedded within Manuel Perez Park. So you may hear us refer to Matt Hoffman Park, or you may hear us to talk about Manuel Perez Park. Manuel Perez Park includes all of Matt Hoffman. So in these images, you can see part of the problem that we are trying to mitigate with this particular project. So these, this is uh, the restrooms that are uh, at Manuel Perez Park, the site of a lot of graffiti. Uh, these are storage containers that are in the park and are used to uh, contain uh, sports equipment and other, other things for the park. At the time these pictures were taken, they had not been tagged yet. They have been now, and I will show you those images later on. And then the, in Matt Hoffman Park itself, at the skate, in, the, in the skate park, there's also graffiti there. So again, um, the budget is $41,000 and it's broken down roughly like this, 13,500 for complete and total coverage of the restroom facility. That means basically everything except for the roof. Uh, there are some exceptions to that that we will go through later on. Um, the containers, 18,500 for the containers, all four sides of each of the three containers, all four vertical sides, you don't have to do the roof. And then the skate park, $9,000 for murals that will cover up to 800 square feet. And whoever the artists are that gets this award, we will work with them on what are the most important areas to cover. Eligibility. This is open to basically anyone in the world that is a professional artist. Uh, so now notice this part that is in bold here is preferred that artists create a culturally diverse team, which will include at least one artist or apprentice who, apprentice artist who lives, works, or attends school in the area bounded by Oklahoma City Boulevard, Southwest 44th, Western Avenue, and I-35. So, uh, and the arts and cultural affairs can aid teams in identifying potential artists and or apprentices. So let me talk specifically about the apprentice here. There is a very strong preference that you will have an apprentice on your team. The apprentice does not have to be named up front. You will name an apprentice if you choose to do so. And again, it is a strong preference. You will name an apprentice if you are selected as one of the finalists or finalist teams. Okay, so you don't need to worry about that right now. If you do have an artist apprentice that you wanna put on the team, fine, go ahead and do that now. There's no reason for you not to, but I just want you to know that you do not need to. Now, an apprentice is somebody who may is, is not recognized as a professional artist yet, usually because of their age, or maybe they haven't done any public work yet. Uh, so an artist under 18 years of age can be an apprentice. And uh, if you are a finalist and you want help in finding an apprentice, we'll be happy to assist you at that time. Submission in bid sync. Once again, uh, you cannot apply for this project. And, by contacting us, you have to go through BidSync. You have to go through the bidding platform called BidSync. And here is information about it. And here is information about first time registration in BidSync. This is how you do it. I'm not gonna go through this right now. The information is there at the uh, okc.gov uh, forward slash arts website. So go there if you have trouble getting um, registered with BidSync, uh, notice this number, 800-990-9339. They have excellent customer service. Call them and they will help you overcome any of the difficulties that you have in getting registered. You can email them, but I recommend that you don't do that. They're great at answering the phone. They're not very good at answering emails. So don't do that part. We're gonna eliminate that in the future. Just give them a call. You can, it, also you can call us, please don't do it at three o'clock on, on Wednesday, December the 16th and, and expect to get any help that is going to be helpful to you. 
Um, somebody always does this. Please don't be that person. Do it. If you're going to call us, call us a couple of days in advance so that we can really give you the kind of help that you need. What do you submit when you are submitting into BitSync? Well, this information right here. So uh, your artist contact information and references. And I want to say that the, the uh, contact information, the references, all of that can be done on one, basically on one page. Uh, you don't have to upload each of these as a separate page. So if you're putting together a team, we want to know everybody that is on the team, their names and their contact information, email and phone, please, for everybody. On references, we do not want letters of references. We want names and how to contact those people. Please do not include letters of reference. They will, nobody's going to look at them. They'll just be shunted off to the side. So we only want to be able, if, if you are uh, chosen as a um, finalist, we're going to contact your references so that we can pass that information along to the selection committee. But uh, one more time, no letters, just names and contact information, however your references want to be contacted. Your resume, please be concise about your resume. Uh, you know, it's, a sad, it's sad but true. Nobody cares very much what you did 10 years ago, five years ago. It doesn't matter how fantastic it, it was. Show us what you have done recently, the last few years and important things that you've done. And don't pat it. If you have done, if you have done um, coffee shop shows, that's fantastic. Put it, and that's all you've done, put it there. We want to know about it. That's an important, it's an important place to start. Don't try to make stuff up. Just be, be honest, but keep it short, concise. Tell your story, whatever your story is, very quickly and concisely. Um, so your uh, JPEGs. Now, I want to read this very carefully. If you're an artist submitting as an artist, as a single person, you are allowed to show six different images. If you are part of an artist team that normally works as a team, you are allowed a total of six images. Here's an example. I'm going to use Rick and Tracy Bewley, who are well-known local artists and who are members of our pre-qualified artist pool. And Rick and Tracy, if you happen to be out there, hello today. Um, I hope you don't mind us using, uh, using you as an example. Rick and Tracy op work together uh, almost all the time as a team. So uh, Rick and Tracy, if they were to enter this, they would be allowed six images. If you are putting together a team that is a one-time team, it may be, there may be five people in the team, uh, you are allowed up to 10 images total. We want to see at least one representative image of the work of each artist, but you can highlight one particular artist. So one artist, if you let's let's imagine that you have a team of five people. Your lead artist maybe has the most experience. Maybe you choose to have six images with the uh, lead artist and one each of each of the other team members giving you a total of 10. So uh, if there are any further questions about those, about that, please uh, submit a question and we'll answer that in just a little bit. Now, this is very important. You also are going to do an image ID sheet, and the image ID sheet, we'll cover this again in a minute, will have thumbnail images of the larger size images. So you're going to be doing two, you're going to be doing images twice in a way. So you're going to submit individual images, full size, two megabytes or smaller, full size images. In addition to that, you're going to create an image ID sheet that will have all of this information on it, including a thumbnail image. We'll go over that in a minute. Schedule of events. Some, some of the things have already happening or are happening as we speak. So the next thing up, what is it? The deadline, December the 16th at four o'clock sharp. After that, um, We'll have our first selection committee on uh, January the 5th, a mandatory site tour on Thursday, January the 14th, the mandatory site tour. It, it is required that you be there in person. If you are an out of state artist and you cannot be there, then you must have a person on your team that can attend. You must have a local project manager 
that can handle um, affairs if you cannot be here. So uh, you need to think about that. If you aren't willing to do that, if you're not willing to be here for that, if you aren't willing to find a local artist, then there's not any point in you sub in, in submitting to this because this is a requirement. We will take all necessary precautions due to COVID. But as of right now, these are the rules. Final presentations will be done. By the way, the, uh, the first meeting, which you will not be attending, that will just be for the selection committee and the final presentations will both be in Zoom. So if you are selected as a finalist, <clears throat> the, the presentation that you make of your conceptual design report will be done in Zoom. Then the finalist is chosen, their uh, concept is presented to the Arts Commission. The Arts Commission recommends it to council or not, they almost invariably do. Uh, council will consider it and if they uh, like what they hear, they will uh, tell us to negotiate a contract with that artist. And once we go through the whole contractual relationship uh, back and forth with the artist, which usually goes relatively quickly, uh, we get it signed, council authorizes uh, that again or, or approves that again, we get a, a purchase order and a notice to proceed and you're off and running. If you have questions about this process again, post them and we'll answer those in a little bit. We don't tell you the names of the selection committee, but the positions are an arts, there's always an arts commissioner on every selection committee, professional art juror, who is the only paid member of the committee. And we uh, get somebody who, who understands artists and art and is able to help guide the rest of the committee in the choices that they make. Uh, this is a parks, obviously it's a parks project. And so we like to have a parks department representative on the committee, at least one, there may be more than one and then a stoke stakeholder who is generally somebody that lives in the neighborhood or is associated with the park in some other way. The committee may have more members than that, but at a minimum, uh, those positions will be filled. Selection criteria. I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, please read it. And uh, just to note that this is a two-stage process. Again, in the first stage, uh, the selection committee reviews uh, the information that you have sent in, primarily your images. Your images are the most important thing that you are going to be submitting. Make sure that your images are, images are clear, that they tell the story that you want to tell. We don't want to see pictures of you in the images. Uh, it's best that there not be people in the images unless they need to be there for scale for some reason. Uh, generally, people in the images distract from the message of your artwork, so try to keep them out. Definitely no images of yourself. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Robbie, how important are images? So, Randy and I talked before we started the webinar because this is like the most important thing in your submission packet. Imagine somebody seeing your work for the first time. And the example I like to use is I have a city issued cell phone, super old. I have to keep it plugged in all the time because it's always out of battery. I would never use this to take photos that I would submit in bid sync. Now my daughter, on the other hand, has a cell phone that I pay for. And it's like a Samsung or something. It must take photos that are 10 times better than this one. If I was going to go out and take photos, I would either use the Samsung or a nicer camera that I might borrow from somebody, or I might even trade out something that I do for some professional photographs. But I would never use this for the photos I would submit for a selection committee to view. We want you to make sure that when you take these images, if they need to be cropped, they should. Don't leave a lot of excess stuff. You know, like if it's a beautiful mural you've done on a fence in a yard, don't have play equipment around and things that would distract us from that. Make sure it's a beautiful image of that mural. It doesn't matter where it is, but make sure it looks its best. Make sure the lighting is right. If you have to stay there all day till the lighting gets right, do it right or don't do it at all because it really will, you'll, we see repeatedly when we go through these selection processes, 
a bad photo really turns selection committees off. So thank you, Randy, for letting me give my pitch on images. It is the most important thing that you submit. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, so in the past, the selection uh, some, in some cases was made almost entirely on the images. Um, the committee, it, we're, we're giving the committees more and more information, especially when where teams are involved. We wanna know that information too, but if you cannot communicate what you can do in images, you're gonna be at a real disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to everything else that is required. Um, and uh, but uh, definitely make the make sure the images are really high quality. I'm going to go back here for just a minute if I can. Well, no, I'll just keep on going forward. So look at the criteria, and um, then also note this. So the three finalists will each receive a thousand dollar if if they go through the entire process. So that means that you need to uh, attend the mandatory site tour and you need to uh, present your conceptual design report. At the end of that, you can submit an invoice and then about two weeks on average after that, you'll get your thousand dollar check. There is only one $1,000 payment per team. If there's five people on the team, a thousand dollars. If there's one artist, a thousand dollars. Okay. Just because you have a team of five doesn't mean that you get $5,000. Uh, copyright, this is something that has changed recently. You retain copyright rights. The city, uh, anyway, read that. Um, the city owns the work, but you own the copyright. Now, the city uh, reserves a lot to itself. And notice that city reserves the right to amend or withdraw this call to artists. We may decide on December 15th. We can't do this for some reason. We have absolutely no idea what that might be right now, but it may be decided that that can't be done. This will be withdrawn. We don't have any obligation to carry through on this. Likewise, on the, um, on the schedule, we have the right to amend the schedule at any time for any reason. So uh, don't build your life around that schedule, but if there is a change, there will be a it will be there will be a notice in BidSync, so it's good to know that um, you know you might want to check back in and see if you see any notices like that. Any questions that come up through the course of this, we may tell you you have to you have you may contact us about that. You may have to go actually to BidSync into their Q and A se section and post that question in BidSync on the page for um, this particular RFQ. Again, any information that goes out to any one artist must go to all artists. Let's see here. Okay. The selected artist uh, will have to provide insurance. Basically, uh, again, I'm not gonna read things that you can read for yourself, but I just want, want to point out that you are required to have insurance it's going to cost you anywhere from $500 to $1,000. You have to be covered. Everybody that shows up on site has to be covered also by workers' compensation, or you must have an exemption from the state of Oklahoma. The exemption costs you $50. We'll give you information about that. You know, this is nothing you have to know. You have to do before you just answer the RFQ, but it's important that you know this if you are selected. Uh, everybody that works on a city web uh, on a city site has to have workers' compensation coverage for themselves, or they have to have a certificate of self-coverage, which is what the exemption is. There are no exceptions to this. If you have subcontractors, they must also be covered. So I'm just warning you that there is a cost involved this for this, and then if you end up being a finalist, we're going to go into great detail about this. And then before you sign the contract, we're gonna go into great detail about it again. You cannot get around this, it costs you money. And again, 500, count on 500 to $1,000 for your liability insurance and then workers' compensation can be quite uh, expensive. So you need to look into that. 
you can get the exemption from the state for $50, but that means that you are covering yourself. <clears throat> okay, this is a, just a short example of an MHID sheet. Thumbnail image, we want to see this information, title of work, the media, dimensions, the date the work was completed, location. All we want to know is the city. We don't want to know it's in somebody's house in blah, 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 in blah, 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 blah. Just city. That's all we need to know. And either the value or the amount of commission. So you may have done something pro bono. Don't put free on there. You know, if you did a 500 square foot mural, what is that worth? $5,000, $125,000, put a realistic value on it. Just because you did it pro bono does not mean that it does isn't worth anything. So put either the value or the amount of commission, but a realistic price. Now, you have a title of work uh, on the file, the actual image file, you're naming that file too. It, you know, it automatically has a name. You take a picture it automatically has a name, which is usually, uh, you know, some numbers dot JPEG. Please name your file too and start it off and name them sequentially. One, two, three, four, five, six. So your first one may be one dot Chris Canaley. I know you're on here, so I'm gonna use you as an example. One dot Canaley dot, and then something that allows you to know what the title is. One dot Canaley dot houses something like that, okay? So just name them sequentially. This makes my life easier. This is the only reason I'm asking you to do it. If, if you don't, if you just give them random names, when you load them into BidSync, they're very hard to track down. They kind of fly everywhere. But if you number, <laughs> name them sequentially, I'm able to create the uh, PDF that goes to the art selection committee very, very quickly. And that's very important. So please, please, please do that. Again, on images, uh, a single artist or an artist team that operates normally as an artist team can have up to six images. You're, if you have a team with 100 people on it, you're, all, you're, you're limited to, to uh, 10 images. This is a VERA waiver because this is on city of Oklahoma City property. You have to sign a VERA waiver. You do not do this at the time of submitting to BidSync. You don't have to upload this. This is for you to know later on. So I'm not gonna go into all the ins and outs of this right now, but this is a necessary protection for the city that allows us to do certain things. Uh, we're not gonna go out and destroy your work of art. That's not the point here. The point is that we can act fast in an emergency situation. If you'd like to more, know more about that later on, feel free to contact me. Now, at the end of the RFQ is a contract and we're not gonna go through it because it goes on many pages, but I really, really encourage you to read through this to understand if you become a finalist on this project or another project and are actually awarded a project you will be expected to sign a contract like this. And it is, and if you, as we hope, you become such a well-known, respected artist around the country that you are working for other cities, states, organizations, you're going to be signing contracts. Get up to speed, learn how to read a contract, learn what you're required to do, because we do expect you to perform according to the thing that you sign. So read it in depth. We're, if you are selected as the finalists, we're gonna go over it with you, but please read it ahead of time and understand what it means to be a professional artist. That's what you're, that's what you're presenting yourself as here by responding to this RFQ. You're saying, I am a professional artist. Professional artists have contracts and they fulfill the contracts. So please read through this. Now, I'm going to, uh, let's see, get out of full screen mode for a little bit and advance up here. And we'll go to this. This is the sculpture called Over the Top that is at the Matt Hoffman Action Sports Park. Recently repainted, the sculpture was installed in 2005. Is that right, Robbie? I think so, yeah. It's one of our, our older works, yeah. 
And at the at the same time that the park that the uh, that Matt Hoffman was built, I, it, it went in right at that time or right after. Mm -hmm. I think I, I was in, living in Oklahoma City right at the time this was done, so my memory is very vague on it. Anyway, recently refurbished, brand new coat of paint. This picture was taken yesterday. No, no tags, no stickers, <laughs> no nothing on it. It's brilliant, beautiful blue, a nice entrance into the Matt Hoffman. So this is hope, what we're hoping is going to set the standard for all the work that is going to be done out at the, uh, at the Manuel Perez. So here's a view of the skate park, looking across the state skate park. A little up close. Now, um, we're not expecting all of this to be covered up. Uh, we're, we're going to selectively work with the chosen artist. And let me say that one artist or one artist team may get the whole ball of wax, every bit of this project, or the selection committee does have the option to divide it up into two or three projects. Again, the projects would be the Matt Hoffman, the restrooms, the containers. We don't know which way they're going to go. Um, so uh, again, this could be one artist or one artist team that gets the entire project or it could be split up. Anyway, whoever ends up with this part of the project, we will go over with you in detail and we will decide together where you will be painting and how much will be painting, but around um, around 800 square feet of surface area. Again, these uh, this was taken yesterday, the restrooms, and so uh, they cleaned this up on right before November 11th for the big dedication of the Manuel Perez Memorial. Uh, and already you can see it's been tagged here and there's some on the backside too. It was, uh, it was in really, really bad shape. Doors kicked in and all that kind of stuff. Um, so General Services, one of our sister departments at the city is going to do surface prep on this before this is painted. Uh, then after it is painted, they're going to come out and they're actually going to apply the um, graffiti resistant coating on it. So a week after it is painting, there will be, this will be under guard to be sure that it is not disturbed before the anti, uh, the, the graffiti resistant coating is put on it. So this is good to know. We thought that you were gonna be, the artist would be required to put it on, but actually general services is gonna do that. And they're also gonna do the prep for you too. So this uh, you know, suddenly has gotten to be uh, a lot better and we thank them for their participation. You're going, you want to go into it thinking that you're going to cover every vertical surface and even this little bit of, um, what is that, soffit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the soffit under there and then whatever this fascia is here. So all of these areas have been tagged in the past and we want them covered up. Now they don't have to be all done to exactly the same degree of detail, which you might do on some of the more prominent vertical surfaces, but you want to think about covering this entire, entire um, building. Uh, this is one of the containers and you saw that beautiful pristine image that I showed you in the RFQ. Well, this is what it looks like now, but you know, it's not bad work. I'm, yeah, I came, after I came back yesterday, I said, hey, the good news is that uh, the quality of the graffiti is going way, way up, a lot better than what we had been seeing out there. Uh, so this is one of the containers. Here's another one. That one's not so good. You know. Shows talent. It's a good graphic design. So anyway, um, the, uh, the street art is getting better. Nonetheless, we don't particularly want to encourage that right here. We want you to create really fantastic art. Maybe you'll decide to keep this and incorporate it into your work. We don't know. But um, we want you to create really, really um, striking and um, important work that the community is going to buy into. And we're talking about two communities here. I'm going to come back to uh, this presentation mode. <clears throat> the community that, actually three communities, the community of Oklahoma City at large, the community in that vicinity, which is uh, the Capitol Hill community, uh, 
uh, that community, and then the uh, the sporting community, mostly the people that use the skate park, but also uh, you didn't. I don't have any images of them here, but there are futsal courts in the park, and then there are also other sporting activities. But primarily, we're interested uh, in the uh, skating skate culture. I don't I know. I, somebody, Chris or Gabe or or, or one or any of you that are that are skaters can correct the terminology later on. Sorry, I'm not up to speed on all of that, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Okay, Robbie, do you have anything to add right now? There were two things I was going to add. Thanks for asking. Just because I know I, I was looking at the participant list and it's very obvious to me that a lot of people on the list, this is very exciting for us. A lot of you have not participated in our selection process before. And so while I think Randy did an excellent job in going over it, I want to kind of emphasize a couple of things for you. For, first of all, on the mandatory site tour, when you're looking at your calendars, that is only for the finalists that are selected after that first screening. So not everybody that submits has to go on a mandatory site tour. It is only mandatory for the three finalist teams, individuals or teams that are selected. Okay, and but if you know you're going to be out of the country or having a major surgery on that date, you might want to pass on this project because you won't be able to accept our invitation. So I just want to make sure that you know that up front. Check your calendar on all those dates. On the other thing, Randy did a really good job of describing to you those insurance requirements. Those insurance requirements are state law. They're non-negotiable. But one of the things that I want to make sure does not worry you, because I think a lot of artists don't typically carry that insurance every day for the mural work you might do, because um, you're not, you might not do a lot of government projects. But what we do is a really good job. If you get selected for this project, we do a really good job of negotiating that for you. Typically at the city, insurance certificates are required before we even present it to council. But in this case, we've been able to uh, advocate on artists behalf that we don't require the insurance certificate until you're ready to start doing the work on the site. So that's something that Randy will manage and you don't have to pay for anything up front. So all of this submission is done for free and you won't be required to do that until after you've actually submitted an invoice and been paid something. So I just wanted to make that clear too. So um, just because not all of us have that kind of money in our account right now to put up front. And those are the only two things I wanted to add just because we have so many new people on the call. Okay, thank you very much, Robbie. And yeah. to add about the insurance, um, you can, we cannot recommend an insurance agent to you. However, we can pass on uh, what other artists have told us, some names that other artists have told us. We're not making a recommendation, but we can pass on that information. So um, there is that, that kind of help out there also, or you can talk to other artists and find out who they've had very good luck with. Uh, anyway, a lot of options out there. Yes. So we have three questions already, I can see. And if you have questions, go ahead and uh, up to four now. So Robbie's gonna, going to read those questions and then we will answer those together. Yeah, so the first one is, when is Oklahoma City going to get a better bidding site than BidSync? Do you mind if I take that one? No, I don't mind a bit, <laughs> All right, as a matter of fact. So we want to make sure everyone knows that at the city, we make very careful, good use of public money. And in doing that, because all of you are the public, including us, um, we try to get services from service providers that are the lowest bid and will accommodate the scope and be the most efficient for all the users at the city. As you can imagine, we have you know over 4,000 people that work at the city doing various jobs. We're one of the largest square, you know, square mile uh, cities in the country. And so BidSync is the best in the nation for what we pay for it. And we could get a different site, but it would cost you as taxpayers more money. 
and we've chosen not to do that. So that's why Randy and I do, uh, we provide a lot of technical assistance to artists to get familiar with BidSync. At the bottom of our emails, if you email us, um, you can see a link where you can always sign up for specific report support from us. And then Randy has pointed out in the BidSync packet how you can get actual provider support from BidSync itself through their phone number as he recommended. So I hope that answers that question well. We're making good use of your public money. And as difficult as, as BidSync is, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people nationwide have successfully navigated BidSync. And we will literally, well, we can't do this literally, we can't hold your hand through it right now because of COVID. But we've yeah. done that in the past. We will walk with you step by step to help you get registered if, if uh, you run into difficulty. So it can be done. This is the other thing too, because you're a city applicant, you get to use BidSync for free. You do not have to subscribe. So even if you got a sales call, you don't have to. But we've actually had artists that have been in our BidSync system for a few years, call us recently and say, how could I get more than Oklahoma? When you go in and register, you set all your own filters. And they've said, I wanna get more than Oklahoma. I'm ready, I now ha have the portfolio. So you can go back in BidSync and set that to more of a regional thing or a national thing. And so use the tool, it's there for you and it's free for you. So learn how to use it well, we recommend that for you. Okay, you want the next question, Randy? Sure. It says for curators, would you like images of exhibitions we have curated? Short answer is yes. We need to see what your curatorial ability is. If, if you're the curator and you're the lead artist for the team, then we need, to, we need to have some idea of your credential based upon images that you are, are submitting. So yes. Okay. And then the next question is for local project manager, I'm assuming your office could suggest someone to non-local applicants. So the person that asked this was local though, and we wanna make sure that submitters understand that if you're submitting, you don't have to have this other project manager if you're local. But let's say you are a submitter who is from another state, you're not located here. Randy, do you wanna to respond to that? Okay, well, first of all, you don't, when you're putting your team together, you do not necessarily have to have a, a local person. It's strongly recommended that you do, but you don't have to. But if you should be chosen as a finalist, at that point, we will help you find somebody. Uh, I, I'm a little, I don't necessarily want to get out there and promise that we're going to help just everybody in the world put a team together uh, right now. We're, that's right. what we are here to do. So if you're out of state, you might want to figure other ways that you could find a local person for your submission, for the, for the first submittal. But if you are, chosen as a finalist, then we will definitely help you at that point. So let's let's talk about both one of the ways that we recommend people is through our pre-qualified pool. And that is a pool of artists. I think we have 200 pages of artists right now that we can recommend in different categories. And we have that on our website. Randy went through and showed you the, the OKC Arts website. But why don't you describe a little bit why we even have that requirement, Randy? What we expect, why we expect kind of a local presence from the, from the artist or the artist team that's selected? There's, there's two yeah. reasons. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is that we've learned by bitter experience, if you don't have a local person, the, art, the out of state artists unfortunately think that we are their um, gophers and we're not, we run the program, but somebody has to be here locally to respond quickly to anything that comes up in the construction process. So um, this is particularly important when there's ongoing construction of whatever the facility is. But anyway, we need people to be able to, to respond very, very quickly, sometime within a matter of uh, an hour or two to situations on the ground. So that's one reason um, that we need. The other is this local buy-in. This is the city of Oklahoma City. It's important that 
anybody from out of state have somebody locally that can explain things to them about what what goes on in Oklahoma City, give them insight. Uh, we want our art to be, uh, this is a little bit of a tightrope. We want art to be timeless and universal, but also to appeal directly to the people of Oklahoma City. Right, and, and the staff here in the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, when an installation begins to end, we do not camp out there with you. You're, you're all professionals, and so we might check on you, make sure you're doing okay, but you're there to do the job. So this is part of that formula. So the last question we have on our list is, have you considered keeping any of the storage containers available to serve as a public graffiti wall? This could allow graffiti writers with an outlet to create instead of vandalizing public property. This park would be the perfect location for something like this. So interesting question. Robbie and I were just talking about this yesterday. We think that there is a potential for doing a graffiti wall. It's something that, that uh, we have shied away from up until now. We don't think that this is the, the time or location. So this is, a, this is a parks project and parks gets to dictate to a great extent because they own it in city parlance, they own this. They get to dictate uh, their, about their property. We think in the future they may see an opportunity at one of the other parks or there may be another location that is not in a park that is particularly a graffiti wall. We think it's an excellent idea. We want to do it. Now we'll see if we can do it. So don't expect it anytime soon, but it will not be on this project. And I want to add to that a little bit because I've, I've, um, I've been the recipient of a lot of stakeholder calls about this park. Um, we have a strong neighborhood initiative adjacent to this site, and I've already been working with that group on a possible um, mural site in their neighborhood. They've received federal funds to do their strong neighborhood initiative, and they, they were even willing to raise money to have kind of an anti-graffiti stance to this. The stakeholders here do not want graffiti. And so they really wanted some beautiful murals that they could be very proud of. And I think that's the other reason that the Parks Department really does not want to see something like a graffiti wall, at least right now, because the stakeholders have been, the, the biggest users of the park have been so strongly against it. So. So Robbie, there's actually more questions. So I don't know, can you scroll on down? And I see can, okay. yeah. Um, the next one is, there seems to be a wide variance of pricing per square foot for each area. Was there a reason? Yes, there is. So uh, what we think is that in, in looking at what has happened up until now in the park, the restrooms for some reason have been the center of all of the activity. And at one point, he, the building was almost entirely covered. So we're imagining that the building itself is going to be more dense. The design on the building is going to be more dense. We're imagining that the designs uh, that are executed on the containers and in the skate park proper will not need to be quite so dense. So that was what led to a variance in, in the pricing. So you should, this is important information for you to understand if you are selected then when you make your uh, conceptual design report, which your proposal is embedded within the conceptual design report, you're going to address it based upon what the budget is and you're going to design accordingly. We don't expect you to deliver something that you cannot deliver. So please design according to the budget that is presented. So the next question is, what is the payment schedule for this project? Is it all post project or is it in increments to start the work? It is in increments. You typically get a certain amount up front, depending on how long we think the project will go, go on. There may be a more or less a midpoint payment with a substantial amount held out to the end. And when the project is 100% concluded and um, the uh, art marker has been installed and everything else uh, has been done according to the contract, then you get the last payment. Uh, so every project is different and it's negotiated up front. up front. You do not sign the contract until you see what that payment schedule is and agree to it. Great. 
can one JPEG contain several images of one project if the subject is difficult or impossible to capture in one photo? Hmm. This is an interesting question. Normally we say no. I think that there is room for an exception, but I think it would be better if you do not jumble it up. I would say if you have maybe two parts, if, it, if it's a very complicated, I, I wouldn't do more than two. Believe it or not, sometimes more information, more information is not actually more helpful to you. If it is that complicated and strong of a piece, go ahead and bite the bullet and do two separate images of it. It may be worth it. Kick out something else that isn't quite so important and show show your best work. It isn't it isn't important that we see, you know, absolutely everything that you've done. To your choose your very very best. So our next question is one that that we see a lot in our information meetings, and it's typically when someone hasn't participated in one of our projects before. We. we this seems to be, I, I think, because a lot of artists are asked to design work without payment. But the Oklahoma City Arts Commission feels very strongly that artists always get paid for every bit of work that they do. And so the question is, do we design the art that we paint on the areas as part of the submission process as well? Definitely not. And if you submit any design ideas, nobody's going to see them. Uh, they come to me and I kick them out. So uh, you, you do not get a leg up by submitting an idea. So if you want to submit an artist statement, you can hint at an approach, but that's as, about as far as you can go. So please do not submit any images of any, anything that you're proposing. When I was a young artist, and believe it or not, way back when I was actually a practicing artist, I made this mistake and I got kicked out immediately. So it happens and we'll do it to you if you submit us any 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 proposal. We don't want to see it. Yeah, we want you to spend all the time between now and the deadline getting the best images you can and putting together a team and having a great identification sheet for those images. So then an anonymous attendee says, if I could join a team, I would be down. I love that. That's a lot of enthusiasm. I hope yeah. everybody on the call has that much. Okay, the next question is- Wait, can I say something about oh, that? Please. So um, ask around. I mean, I, we know that there are people looking for team members. So, um, I, you know, post something on social media, say that- That's what I think. Social media might be the best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Try to find a, try to find a team that you can collaborate with. Um, this is another thing Randy and I were talking about yesterday because I used to do marketing for a major architectural and engineering firm in Oklahoma City. And as architectural professionals and engineering professionals, they do this all the time. Um, you look at the, the RFQ that comes out, what are the qualifications, what are they trying to do, and you seek out a team member who has the best credentials to do that. You might just really want the work, but you know somebody that may not even be from around here, or they may, and you pick out who you think in your mind will get this job, has the, has the best talent to get the job, and you make them part of your team. <laughs> so just to, it's something architects and engineers have been doing for decades. So um, the next question is, must the work examples be ones of public works and murals specifically, or could the inclusion of some works on canvas, et cetera, be sufficient if they help to communicate our ideas and abilities? Yes, the second part use whatever images of any work that tells your story to the fullest extent possible. So it, of course, it's gonna be helpful for you to have had a mural, but if you are, if you're painting and you have really strong images and talent is shown, submit your best work. Okay, the next question is, can one artist submit on multiple team submissions? No. Do we need to ex explain a little bit? I, I do think we do want to explain that we want a commitment to a team. 
And, and so if you just want to throw your hat in the ring with whoever gets the job, that that's not what we're looking for. We're looking at a commitment because one of the things that, um, that a finalist team will have to present in that final presentation is how they've worked you know, or, or it would be a good idea to present how you've worked with these other team members before. And if you're just a work for hire on a bunch of different teams, that's probably not gonna win the job for you. We want you to really focus on a team collaborative effort if you come in as a team that you're committed to, so. Now, one thing that can happen, uh, let's say that you're on team B, team A and you're not chosen, team B is the finalist and is chosen, they may decide to add to the team after they have been chosen. That's perfectly okay, that can happen. But uh, at, the, at the first part, the first selection process, no, choose a team or come as an individual and then we'll see what happens after that. Right. The next question is, is really good too. Will general services provide surface prep and anti-graffiti coverage on all three locations or just the restroom site? Don't know the answer to that, but um, uh, that information will be given at the mandatory site tour for the finalists. We don't know that yet. We know definitely that it will be on the restroom. Okay. Um, the next two, I think we've already answered in other ways. So I'm gonna go ahead and skip. Can you further explain your definition of an apprentice artist and who would be considered to be one? So if you notice in the eligibility, an artist is uh, by our definition is 18 or older. So an apprentice that, that is under 18 automatically would be considered an apprentice, even if they have somewhat, even if they've done some public art. Um, so that would be an apprentice. Could be somebody 18 or over that just doesn't have much experience and, and not much exposure. Um, I suppose conceivably it could be somebody who is 60 years old, although that's probably unlikely. But uh, usually it's going to be a young person that does not have uh, public art experience or doesn't have a whole lot of art experience. So the next question is, who is the main audience and how much say will stakeholders have in the final artwork? Do you mind if I start start that well, one and you I'd finish it off? Okay, so what we know here at the city, we've only had a 1% for art ordinance since 2009. And we didn't even really start spending the money on that until eight years ago. So we have a fairly new program. And one of the things that the Arts Commission has um, advocated for is people support what they help to create. So stakeholders being on an art selection panel helps educate them and engage them. And in, in mine and Randy's involvement in this over those eight years since we've had an Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs, we've really seen the bar raise in our stakeholder involvement and their understanding about what art is. What I always love on a stakeholder panel is when somebody says, you really want me on this, this selection committee? Because I don't know a lot about art. And I said, you're, I always respond that you're the one I really want on this panel because you're gonna be surrounded by people who do understand. And we wanna make sure by the end of this, you have that same understanding. So let me explain that a little bit. So the Parks Department representative is someone who is an advocate, the, that Parks representative on this panel, they're an advocate inside the city for how the selection process is fair and what kind of talent they saw. They, they come out of this going from thinking that all artists sit with an easel and a brush and some paint to, oh my gosh, you should see the kind of incredible talent we have competing for these projects. We need more people like that inside the city saying that about the art program and the artist talent we have here in Oklahoma City. So that's why they're there. You know the arts commissioners, a lot of you know some of them or you know that they are the staunch support. They're the reason that after 40 years, the city finally has an arts, a 1% for art ordinance because they fought for that for 40 years knowing how it would elevate this city and the kind of talent it would develop. And we've seen that grow in eight short years. Um, I wanna talk about the stakeholders themselves. 
we have watched a stakeholder go from I know nothing to being one of the biggest art supporters that every neighborhood project that's discussed from that point on has a mural in it or something painted or a sculpture. Even their, their expectations for art in this city elevates just because they participated on a panel. And also their enthusiasm for art in parks and public places grows to the point that everyone that they know becomes very protective of public art. So these are the reasons why those stakeholders are so important. And their expectation raised the entire community's expectations for public art and how important it is to this city. We are not even a 10 year old program yet. And art is often the first thing that neighborhoods talk about when they receive grant money about what they wanna do with it. And that's only because we use stakeholders in our art selection and they feel very comfortable with it. And Randy also mentioned that there is one paid arts professional on every panel. That paid professional has a really important job. We use a sliding scale that we updated just this past year um, to a higher level because we require more from that art professional. They help us um, prepare and um, introduce the entire selection panel to the project. They help us inspire the finalists that attend that mandatory site tour about what we're looking for, what is possible at the site. And then when the final deliberation happens on the selection panel, after the three presentations are made, they help us deliberate, they respond to questions about styles, materials, longevity, all of the things, they help support staff in doing that because we don't vote, but they get a vote in this. So I just want everyone involved in the call, it, if, if you might've thought that non-art professionals should never be on a selection panel, I would say we have a lot of experience that we disagree because they are the one reason why we think that the arts will be here to stay and a 1% program will never be discussed as an option to eliminate from the budget of the city. It's too important to the city. Very nicely put. And I, I couldn't help but think about uh, one project in particular that illustrates this, Lake Draper Trail Project, which had mm -hmm. four separate projects in it. Yeah. The neighborhood stakeholder went from a person who was interested in art but, by, but professed not to know much about it by the by the end of the uh, selection of the fourth pro fourth project he was making critical from a critique right. standpoint not negative but critical comments that were <laughs> ever bit as professional as the professional artist and he became a fierce champion of every piece of art that is out there and for art on trails generally so this this is exactly what Robbie was talking about mm -hmm. And we did just get another question that came in um, from a public art commission experience standpoint in this RFQ, should the six JPEGs be focused only on mural work or on a, a body of public artwork? Well, it's a good question. What tells your story the best? This is a mural project. So at a minimum, you want it heavily weighted to any mural work that you've done. But if you haven't, if you haven't, done a lot of mural work, but you've done other types of work that shows that you have a broad range of skills and good design ability, then maybe that helps tell your story better. This is an individual call. So you yeah. decide for yourself. And I want to go back to the selection criteria too. Uh, Randy has broken out the selection criteria for the first selection and the finalists. So be sure to look at that selection criteria and what it says to you know, each of you on this call do different kinds of work. Some of you may want to have a full body of work if it really helps tell your story, talks about your artistic excellence, your originality, and your ability to produce a consistent body of work. Some of you will only want to use mural images, you know, so it's it, like, I just want to support what Randy said. That's very individualistic because we don't know what your portfolios are. And, and you'll need to make that call, but use that selection criteria to help guide you in your decisions. Definitely. So if that's the end of the questions, we'll, we'll give you another minute. It's 3.10. Um, we'll, we won't 
stay on indefinitely, but if there are any other questions, look like another one just came in, I think. It did. Does every member of a team need an image of work? That's yes and no. We would like to see at least one image from every team member. But, um, and I, I think that it is stated as such in the RFQ. Um, so it would be ideal, but you can definitely, you can definitely um, load up on, you know, the work of one individual on the team. And I think too, just to add to that, it, it kind of depends on the role of the team members as well, right, Randy? Yes, it, like, does. it does. Yeah, because you may have a team member that um, will be responsible for, say, a lot of the paperwork and more of managing things. And we might not need images of that team member, you know, if, if a lot of what they're doing is going to be administrative for your team, they're going to order all the supplies, they're going to make sure they get there, they're going to work out the schedules, things like that. For them, maybe a reference is more important. Point. Yeah. And then some of your other, you know, the creative side, the, the highly creative side, that, that's probably where you want to focus on images. I think another one came in too. It did. Yeah. Oh, it was just, yeah. We could, someone was correcting a spelling thing, but we saw okay. that. Yeah. So we are um, very glad to see the uh, interest in this project. And we think it's going to be an excellent showcase for an artist, an artist team, or multiple artist teams. We're not, again, we don't know exactly which way it's going to go that will be largely decided by the selection committee. And uh, again, you can submit questions uh, to us. We may, again, we may not be able to answer them. We may tell you, you have to submit those in the Q&A section of BidSync and no, no questions will be answered other than something that is obvious already and will point you to the RFQ a week before the deadline. So all questions must be submitted before then. This is part of the whole fairness setup that we have. Uh, there's a cutoff to the Q&A. So having said all of that, uh, thank you for your participation today. And we really look forward to your submissions for this project. So good luck. Yeah, thank you.